Hello, and welcome to our Daily Herald Book Club event with Sarah Fry and author of The Growing Season. This event is part of the Mackinac Arts Center author series, and I'm your host, Diana Martinez. After the interview, we're going to ask you to join us for Q&A on Zoom, where Sarah will answer all your questions. I'm so honored to introduce you to author Sarah Fry, who is an American farmer, an entrepreneur, an author, and soon to be an executive TV producer. Welcome, Sarah. Thank you so much for having me here today. I'm, I'm so excited to get to sit down and talk to you here at this wonderful place and, and share more of my story. Well, Sarah, I have to tell you, when um, your book was sent to me, and, and I saw the title of it, The Growing Season, and, and I thought, you know what, I'm not, I'm not into growing pumpkins, and I just kind of put it on the counter. And then on Thanksgiving, I threw the bird in the oven, and it was cold, and I picked it up, and I started, and I couldn't put it down. <laughs> and and I, your story is um, humbling, it's inspiring, and, and I, I want to talk, because I know everybody who's watching hasn't read the book, and, and one thing that you, you write in your book, you say, first people assume that I inherited the company. I understand how this assumption is made. At events like this, I'm frequently mistaken for someone's wife. They don't know that very morning, I was clad in grubby jeans, my unbrushed hair pulled back under a ball cap, yelling over the noise in the sorting room. <laughs> so tell us about your family business, the family business. Sure. So I, um, I grew up, as you know, uh, on a small farm in Southern Illinois with four older brothers. And I talk about that experience uh, in depth in, in the uh, book, The Growing Season. And most of my childhood was spent as a grubby little kid, like r mm -hmm. running around that farm. So as you can imagine, I was a little girl with these four older brothers. So I wasn't really much on, you know, making myself look pretty. And if I ever wanted to play with dolls, I mean, I would have been doing that by myself and, you know, yeah. not, with, not with those older brothers. So I learned to sort of do things that boys do growing up on farms. And that carried over into my adult life today. So I started my company at a very early age. And today we farm and operate fresh produce facilities in seven different states. And we make really delicious ingredients and products that are manufactured actually on the farms where we grow. And my life is very, you know, it's funny that you pick that passage to read out of the book because my life is, is very different. I'm sitting here today with you in this beautiful studio and you know, I have on makeup and my, and my hair is done, but most days of my life, um, you know, I am pretty much in a ball cap and blue jeans and could be on a farm in Florida or Georgia or Illinois or Indiana or wherever. And, and sometimes I find myself in, in, you know, in cities and going to you know, meetings or having where fancy you dinners. Came from? Where you came from, when I, I think this is what was most fascinating to me. I know I, I've driven past the farms, right? I didn't grow up with mm -hmm. the silver spoon in my mouth either, so I, I can relate to some of your story. Mm -hmm. But your story is, was rough. Yeah. That childhood was rough. Mm -hmm. You guys hunted for your own food, mm -hmm. no running water, mm -hmm. no heat. Mm -hmm. So w wood stoves. Yeah. And it, it was startling to me that in this generation, and when people say rural America, I think, I think that when we are watching the news and we say, we hear rural America, we think of this charming farm, right? And this beautiful sunset on the yes. farm and the wheat is, is waving. And when I read the book, it, it finally clicked. Mm -hmm. This is what she's talking about. This is what, this is the challenges with rural America and people who feel left behind. And it was shocking to me to realize that in this day and age, there are families that are living with such harsh conditions. Yeah. And I think, you know, that is part of the reason that I wanted to write my memoir was to shine a light on what life is actually like in rural America. I mean, I'm really not that old to have experienced that at such an, you know, at, at no. such, an, such an early age. And um, now some of how I was raised was sort of by my father's own design, right? Mm -hmm. There were 
things that we probably could have had that he didn't necessarily allow us to have. Um, but when you think about what it's like to grow up in rural America and what it's like not to have, especially in this day and age, I mean, most people, you know, they, everyone pretty much takes for granted and believes that everyone has access to the internet. But exactly. Like, at this day and age, even where I'm from, um, you know, the kids had no choice but to go back to school. The teachers decided to open the school this fall and bring all the kids back for a full schedule because the children, in that rural community had no access to internet. And probably no, no computers. No no computers, no, and, and even if they had computers, they didn't have access to internet. And, and we that, are talking about Orchard, Orchardville, mm -hmm, Illinois. Yeah. We are not talking about some far away place. Right. We are talking about yeah. central southern Illinois. Yeah, southern Illinois, um, at, but it's, it's very indicative of other rural communities across exactly. the country. I mean, it's not, it's not unique to just you know, downstate. It is uh, a problem that, that we have uh, uh, across the country. And, you know, so much of my childhood and the stories that I share in the book, um, you know, is really, uh, although they're hard and they were at times hard for me to write and um, to share, but all of those experiences ultimately ended up making me who I am today. And that's what I want to ask you, because in the book, your father does something to you when you're really little. There's a huge snapping turtle. Can you tell this story? Oh, Because it terrified turtle. me reading it. Yeah. I'm like, I don't think I could do that. <laughs> yeah. So uh, most days as kids, we spent, uh, we spent a lot of time, especially um, in the winter, you know, it, we were always either hunting for our food, and then in the summer, we were harvesting our food. But nothing went to waste on this farm where we grew up, and, and we've, we lived off of the land. And one day I was driving along, um, I was very small, I was maybe seven or eight years old, and I was in the pickup truck with my father. And there was this huge snapping turtle in the middle of this gravel road. And the truck sort of pulls up to it, and I'm, I'm little, where I am really struggling to sort of see over the dash and over the hood. And I remember looking at it in, in just such great awe, thinking that's the biggest snapping turtle in the world. And so my father's staring at it, I'm staring at it. And then he pulls the truck around up in front of the snapping turtle. And then he turns to me and he looks at me and he says, I want you to get out and put that turtle in the back of the truck. Now, mind you, this turtle, it's not like a turtle like this. This is a big turtle, like the size of a trash can lid. And I thought, there's no way he's serious, you know? So I looked at my father and said, you want that turtle? You get out. You put that turtle on the back of the truck. I'm not going out there. But he looked at me very seriously and he said, I said, get out of the truck and go put that turtle in the back of the truck. So this turtle's head is like this big around and you know, they're nasty, they're mean, they hiss. The thing could have taken off my hand. And I'm sitting, I'm like, oh my goodness, he is, he's not kidding. And I never challenged my father's authority growing up. None of us did. I mean, if you were, you were told to do something, you did it. And um, I remember thinking to myself, uh, I'm, go I'm going to get hurt or I'm going to get injured by this turtle. And then I thought, well, now I'm going to throw a, a, a little fit. I'm going to try to be a girl now because I had spent so much time sort of being, being tough and trying to, trying to, you know, I can do anything the boys can do. And I thought, oh, wait, hold on. <laughs> maybe, <laughs> that wasn't, this. maybe that wasn't the best strategy. I'm like, but dad, it's, it's going to hurt me. He's like, either you're going to be a girly girl all the time or you're going to get out and you're going to put that turtle in the back of the truck. And I thought, okay, that's it. So we both get out of the truck and by the time we make it to the back of the truck and we're looking at the turtle in the road, I know I have to do this and I've already committed in my head. Well, you know, if I get hurt, I get hurt. It's gonna have, I, I have to try. He told me to do it. There's a moment though where I see this once he's out of the truck and he sees the turtle like in person, you know, like up close and personal with it. Not such a great idea. I see this flash of, oh, maybe, maybe I shouldn't have 
But he's not backing up. He's not saying anything. But I think if I would have pressed at that moment, I probably could have gotten out of it. But by this time, the turtle's moving toward the tall weeds. And I'm thinking to myself, OK, I can't renegotiate. Because if he says, no, I have to do it, then the turtle's in the weeds. And I have to, I have to you know, chase the turtle through the weeds, which is going to be worse. much worse. And I was, my heart was pounding. I had all of this adrenaline in my little body. And I remember just looking down at its like great big thick long tail. I thought, okay, that's that's where I'm picking it up at. And it was just, it was really this incredibly high moment for me where it was pure adrenaline. And I leaned down and grabbed that turtle by the tail with one hand, with one hand. And as I grabbed it by the tail, I closed my eyes because I thought, okay, this is where I get bit. This is, this is, you know, and, but I did it so quickly. And in one fail swoop, I remember just bringing it up over my head and it, it wasn't even in my hands for, I, I mean, it was like not even a full, like three seconds. I mean, it was just, I did it so quickly and it went up in the air before I let it go. And my eyes were just pressed tightly and i heard this thud and it was the turtle landing in the back of the truck and when i heard the thud my eyes popped open and i thought oh my gosh i just put that turtle <laughs> in the truck it's, it's like in the truck i couldn't believe it and then i'm like it's in the truck it's in the truck you know and then i and then i i look and it's i threw the turtle in the, in, you did the, it. in the truck and my heart was pounding and i don't know if you like if, the, if you've ever had an experience that was really, really scary or you lived through something where you thought maybe you would die, but that feeling after mm -hmm. is kind of like an adrenaline rush, right? Sure. And so I just went through this, but there I almost had this high from it too. And so I walk back up and I get into the cab of the truck and I'm sitting there and I just, but I'm, I'm feeling this, this sense of accomplishment, this sense of, I can do any, that's the new power almost. And my father gets back into the truck to drive away. And I was very careful not to let him see that. You know, I didn't, I didn't want him to ultimately see that satisfaction because I thought, no, you're, you're, you're bad right now. <laughs> yeah. That was a bad plan. You're a bad person. But, uh, so I'm not gonna let you see the satisfaction that I have on my face. So I looked out the window so he couldn't sort of see that, that you know, the, the smile on my face where I was like, yeah, I did that. You know, there's points in the book where with your father, the reader doesn't like him. Oh, there's no question. You no. know, um, there's parts that are hard to read. Yes. Where he, he looked the other way when there is a farmhand yeah. abusing you. Yeah. Because he needed the help. Yeah. Um, and there's so many times I was so angry with him yes. when I was reading the book. However, I question who taught you the most in your life. Mm. He did. Yeah. You know? He was, uh, you know, he taught me a lot. My mother taught me a lot. You know, we really all, we really all do become sort of as some of the experiences that we have and the influences around us. And you know, very candid and very real in the writing uh, and with, with the characters. And I think one of the things, one of the key takeaways, and we can all relate to this, is we have so many imperfect people in our lives, we all do, um, whether it's family, friends, people that we work with. and. I think the biggest takeaway from the growing season as it relates to imperfect people is that it's okay to still love those people and to take the good. Mm -hmm. And it's no different than, you know, what happens in, in my life on the farm with imperfect pieces of fruit. We don't just discard the imperfect pieces of fruit because they're, you know, not pretty enough to sell to, you know, say one of our retail partners to end up at a produce department, um, we'll take that fruit and we'll make something delicious out of it, like an ingredient, and we'll find its higher purpose and the greater value in that fruit that is very imperfect. And I feel like that about people. 
And I think I learned that lesson very young because that was actually a conflict for me growing up, you know, because as a kid, you sort of want to see things black and white, you know, and right I is wonder, right and did wrong you know? is wrong. And but did you know? Did you yeah. know how off this was? Yes. You did? Yes. When did you realize how off this whole situation was? Um, at a very, very early age. I mean, I, I was a very intuitive child and mm -hmm. I had been out into the world just enough. And then after I went to school and I saw how other kids and other families were, um, that's when I realized that the way that I was growing up was very different. Um, and not all just bad. No, just um, different. Because there was a lot of good. And I remember making a determination when I was ab in about first or second grade that although the way I was growing up was incredibly difficult, I still chose that life because of the freedoms that I had. So I had freedoms that other children didn't have. They were a different kind of freedom. So maybe I didn't get to go to town. Maybe I wasn't getting to go to the mall to shop with my mom and do like normal things. But I had freedoms that the other children didn't have. The freedom to disappear and get lost in the woods for a day. The freedom to go swim unsupervised anytime I wanted to in a pond or a lake or play in a river or in a stream. And, and uh, the freedom to, you know, ride magnificent horses that were very dangerous that, you know, a small child shouldn't have been getting on, you know, uh, when she was so young. And um, when I took all of that into consideration uh, in even thinking about, and I had this family, I had this incredible family. I mean, I had four older brothers that I loved so much and we were so tight growing up. So when I sort of weighed the value of all of the sort of different lives that I, that I was presented with, the one that I was living, no matter how difficult, was the one that I would have, would have still chose. And I, I think sometimes, when I was reading the book, I'm like, had she grown up in a normal family, she would have never been who she is, I don't think. There's no question. There's had no had question. she grown up in, in a place where you had everything given to you? And, and I often think, when I look back at my friends and people I've known in my life, it always seems to be the people who had it the hardest seem to do the best in many yeah. ways yeah. Um, because it get, makes you be, you have grit. Yeah, the advantage becomes the disadvantage. And that's sort of the question that a lot of people ask themselves now who have had difficult upbringings and who have had challenges in their life because it's our, it's our natural, natural desire and instinct when we become parents to make our children's lives easier and better than what we had. And there's nothing wrong with that. But, and I've had to really sort of coach myself through this parenting process because I have two boys, they're 15 and 16 now, William and Luke, and they're incredibly wonderful, hardworking, kind, just good, I've raised good humans. Um, but my natural instinct has been to just make everything easy in their life and give them everything that I didn't have and more. I mean, give them the moon, right? So I have had to really be uh, mindful of the different uh, opportunities that I could give them and the things, the challenges that I, that I needed to step back and let them face on their own. And then also create teaching moments because our life was the life that I had built and created and brought them into uh, was very, very different and it was a much easier life. So I had to sort of go out of my way and take the time to do that, to go out of my way to make sure that they knew that that really wasn't indicative of how the rest of the world lived and that, that so much would be expected of them, much more would be expected of them because they had opportunities that others might not have. And I think that <sighs> When you think about raising young people and the challenges that um, they face, it's better, I believe, and, and through my own experiences, to have to go through some things when you're really young mm -hmm. um, to build that resiliency. 
I agree. And as a parent, to throw the turtle in the truck. Yeah, and as a parent. And I, you know, I'm not advocating Go for find anyone. Go turtle, everybody. Yes, yes, I'm not advocating for anyone to raise their kids um, the way that that mine did. Although, it, you know, it, it worked out for me. Um, but I would say, if we don't allow children to have struggles and and failures when they're young, and if we shelter them from that, when they have those struggles when they're older and when they're adults and you're not there as the parent, as the mom or right. the dad, or you know, the, the, the family member to, to shield them from that, it's much more difficult to deal with those struggles as an adult. They because, don't know how. And they're bigger issues. Mm -hmm. So it's really better, I think that young people are really uh, better off to, to, go f to go through some things and to have those struggles and to have you know a few failures at an early age and mm -hmm. to build up that resilience so that when they face real adult type challenges later in life, they don't melt down. And um, you know I know, like I said, I don't I, I definitely don't advocate for um, you know, putting your, your children through <laughs> an excessive amount of resiliency building. But I know that for me in my life, it's the entire, it's, it's really, really so much of my childhood prepared me for everything that I took on as an adult. When you turned 15, 16, you started living on your own. You decided you had enough of living in that house mm -hmm. and you took over a, a home, a property uh, mm -hmm. on the farm. Mm -hmm and made it your home mm -hmm. and you put yourself through school in a community college and we're in a community college I know. and it so makes great. me want want every every person who feels like i don't have you know access to college and i don't have this and i i think about the blind ambition you had at 15 16 like you didn't even mm -hmm. know what you're getting into but you're getting into it right yeah. and you started selling things yeah. and can you talk a little bit about how you started the business sure i am um, when I was a little girl, my mom had a summer melon delivery route. And for me, I had spent the majority of my life planning to escape the farm. You know, I'm thinking, this is great. You know, I love being here with my brothers, but so much of this is, is really, really sort of a harsh way to grow mm -hmm. up. And I remember getting to go on a trip to Chicago with my father. And it was one of the few trips to Chicago where we ended up downtown for some reason. And my first um, memory of Michigan Avenue, you know, I was, I was in awe of the buildings, the architecture, but I was also in awe of the people. And I was in awe of the women that I saw walking down the streets in their beautiful coats, carrying their briefcases or their nice purses. And, I imagined where they were all going, and I thought, oh, they, they work in these big buildings, and you know, someday that's what I'm going to do, and I'm gonna work really hard, and I'm gonna go to school, I'm gonna get good grades, and I'm gonna go to college so that I can live here and do this too, because that's, that's what I wanna be. So then I painted this mental image of who I wanted to be. And as a little girl, you know, the closest thing that I got to getting off of the farm and into you know, uh, a, a larger metropolitan area was going with my mother on this melon delivery route to grocery stores to sell cantaloupes and watermelons. And she really, uh, she really was the force behind teaching me about business. And mm -hmm. I don't think she even knew um, that she was doing it. But um, and really, it was a function of she was she was busy. She was working so hard. She was you know she was hot and sweaty and busy and had been loading melons all day and in the heat. And, and she chose the yeah. heaviest thing. Yeah, right. like, why did you guys choose? Why did you do yeah. tomatoes? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> no, it was melons. Um, but she she was busy, so there wasn't really time to explain things to me. So she would just say, "Get out of the truck, go <coughs> see the produce manager," and find out how many melons he wants and I'll be in the back of the store. So, okay, so what do you do? You don't, you don't tell your parents no, but I remember the first time I had to do that, I was terrified, but I didn't question her. I wasn't like, no, I really don't wanna go talk to that person because you know, they, they might say no or whatever. So I just did it. And you know, the, 
And thank goodness, the first time I did it, the produce manager was really quite kind. And, and he took this tiny little person in front of him, you know, seriously and gave me an order for the melons. And I walked through the back of the store to the loading dock where my mother had parked the truck, unloaded the melons, and then pushed the cart of melons back into the produce department and wrote his ticket up and then had him sign it. And then I went to the front office and collected the cash. And I thought, well, I can do this. This is a job that I can do. And I was like eight years old at the time. And um, so I had had that experience in the summer with my mom, and then that became my job to interface with the customer, to take the order, to upsell the customer on, you know, more melons, or, you know, at times it was even the Frito-Lay guy in the parking lot of a grocery store where we'd, I'd be like, ooh, those are Doritos, <laughs> let's trade. Look, I have a melon, let's make a deal. So the deal making um, was instilled in me at a, at a very early age. And then by the time I was old enough to drive, I bought a truck and then expand, took, her, took over her the route that she had and just grew the number of stores that I was delivering to. Harvard used examples of how you landed the Walmart deal. So you mm -hmm. went, for those who haven't read the book, she made a deal with the bank, which I mm -hmm. love that story too, mm -hmm. that I want a loan to buy a bigger truck because mm -hmm. you realize if I have a bigger truck, I can yeah. sell more melons and then this th yeah. this will be good. And and get you get the loan for three mm -hmm. months, pay it off in three months, and the banker's like, what the heck, which was also awesome yeah. for later. Yes. So you sell your melons, but let's talk about the Harvard case study. Um, this is really where I think your career just totally shifted. Yeah, it was at a different, it was, it was kind of an inflection point um, in, in my career, actually. I, you know, I went to, I attended high school and a junior college simultaneously. Dual um, credit? Yeah, because I, mm -hmm. I was trying to do everything so quickly. Like, so the goal is, Get off, the, get off the farm, move to the city. I have this image of this woman that I want to be, so I want to get it all done. And By the way, do you have a house in the city? I don't, actually. Isn't that funny? <laughs> you have a place I, in Florida. Yeah, but I don't, I don't, I don't keep a funny? place in the city. I do love the city. I love to, I love to visit, but I also like to check out of a hotel when I leave. So, um, it was my, it was my dream to move off of the farm, but it, I felt like also everything that I was, no matter what I did, everything kept sort of pulling me, pulling me back. And, you know, at the time that the Harvard did the negotiation case study, I was in my mid twenties and I had already built, you know, pretty sizable company and the study centered around how a smaller company like the one that I had built was able to compete with much larger companies all doing business with a large retailer like Walmart and um, I remember when they called and I'm thinking is this like Harvard calling me like why is Harvard calling me I'm the girl that you know ultimately got through you know a, a community college received an associate's degree in science but started my business and you know what is it what is it that they could possibly learn from me you know at that point in my life and and, and I thought when they started asking questions it provoked my own thought because they would ask me well how did you do this and how did you do that and the only answer that I had was I don't know I just did it you know, and it took them a very long time to pull things out of me for that study because I'm thinking, well, well, I don't know. You just like do it. You know, you. So I you figured walk it out. into a construction <laughs> site basically for a Walmart and say, who are you going to buy your vegetables from? Yeah, exactly. And get a deal yeah. and don't realize how big the deal is. I right. don't think you realized that in that moment, no, did you? No, I, I, I didn't. I was thinking about making my own life easier because I was delivering directly to their stores, just like I was to any other grocery store chain. I was going from one store to another to deliver the melons. And I, I saw this place that was finally, you know, it looked like I had watched it being built, this distribution center for, you know, a series of months driving by it with my, with my load of melons. And then one day it looked like there was life there and that people were, you know, staffing 
the facility. So I thought, you know what, I'm just gonna pull in there because it would make my life so much easier if I didn't have to go to these 12 to 15 Walmart stores you know, individually, if I could just take this load of melons there, then they could distribute it and that'd be great. I wasn't thinking in terms of, oh, these, you know, I could take big trucks and I could do this, I could do that. And I didn't have an appointment and I walked right through the door and just asked to talk to someone who was in charge. But that was that sort of, you know, like you talked about blind ambition. And at that point, I was so used to walking through doors and talking to strangers it didn't matter that i was a teenage kid <laughs> it didn't it didn't matter how young i was one thing that i got out of reading the book that i found so fascinating is now at the grocery store i have such a respect for how this got mm -hmm. to the grocery store oh, yeah. i mm -hmm. hadn't you know i never really thought about yeah the how short of a window you have to deliver these vegetables the heat the truck breaks down. You know, I was a nervous wreck reading your book when the first big delivery <laughs> and you did not want to miss yeah. the mark and get it to the distribution center. And you didn't really have the infrastructure to yeah. deliver thousands and thousands yeah. of melons in a truck and your brother's yeah. trying to get the <laughs> melons there. And I'm like, this is insanity. Yeah. And you're, you're really playing beat the clock because yeah. you, they can't get rotten or right. the game's over. Yeah. It's, uh, you know, the, um, the fresh produce industry is a really high intensity industry because everything is so time sensitive. You know, it's not like we're mad and, you know, manufacturing products under a roof that right. can be stored for a period of time that you maintain inventories on. When fruits and vegetables are ready to go, they're ready to go and everything is time sensitive. It's actually, it's actually the probably uh, most stressful um, profession in, in agriculture because it's, uh, it's so incredibly, incredibly time sensitive. It's not like harvesting grain that can be stored in a, you know, for months at a time in a mm -hmm. grain bin and then you sell right. it off when the, when the markets, you know, are favorable. You, you fresh fruits and vegetables are ready when they're ready and you sell them off whether the markets are favorable or unfavorable. Well, and then the other challenge you have is labor. Yes. How do you get all this labor like, bam, I need it now. Yeah. We have to harvest, we have to get it out, we have to get it shipped, you know, and, and then you don't need these people for a long time. Yeah. And, and I love your story about how you fought for immigration rights and, and how mm. you continue yeah. to fight to help well, make you, this better. You, if you think about it, there's so many arguments around immigration as it, uh, as it relates to our industry and agriculture. You hear the, well, and these should be American jobs. And I am first and foremost for the American worker in whatever field it is. Mm -hmm. I, by, it's, I think sure. we, we all consider the American worker first. But when you think about where our products are grown in the different uh, rural areas across the country. So they're not growing here in Chicago, right? They're right. growing in Southern Illinois where you simply don't have the population mm -hmm. to support the workforce needed for a short seasonal time frame. Right. So if we're harvesting in Southern Illinois, we're harvesting for a four to six week window usually, where we need a lot of people, a lot of workers for a, for a very short period of time. Now, if we were harvesting in a suburb outside of the city here for four to six weeks, we could probably attract enough workers to get mm -hmm. that job done, but because the needs are in rural communities, the workforce needs are in rural communities that don't have the population to support the number of jobs needed during such a short and condensed period of time. Our country relies on an immigrant workforce. And we use a program called the H2A program in our company where workers come here, they are issued work visas, they have background checks, and they're temporary guest workers. They perform their job for a certain period of time, and then they travel back to their home mm -hmm. country. Now, agriculture needs an overhaul, whereas immigration is concerned. 
I, my company participates in that program. Uh, there are other companies that don't participate in that program. We can't afford not to because we have to have access to a workforce that we can count on being here. Mm -hmm. And when you think about the time, sensitivity, uh, time sensitivity around fresh fruits and vegetables and getting them harvested, we can't have, oh, well, we'll be there in a week to right. harvest your, yeah, no, <laughs> we need you now, you know? Right. So all of that is very uh, carefully planned out. But it also puts our company at a competitive disadvantage because we're using, you know, H2A guest workers, which is, um, I think it's been a, a great program for our company to use and it's allowed the same people to come back every mm -hmm. year and then return to their home country. Um, but what about all of the undocumented workers who've been working in agriculture? I believe that it's really not a complicated issue. I believe that a lot of those, those workers who are working in, currently working in agriculture who are undocumented should be able to very easily enroll in a guest worker program that would allow them uh, to continue to work in agriculture and to do it in such a way that they didn't have to worry about. Just create you a know, path. They're like, it's so simple, we just well, need a path. It's, it, it's not even necessarily a path to citizenship. There's such a quick right. and simple fix for it now is it's a path to be here and do what you're already doing in agriculture and do it legally. Exactly. You know, here's a work permit that, that now you don't have to stress out. Now you don't have to right. worry. Now you can work and do the do this job that, you know, is a job of, of, of great integrity when you think about, you know, harvesting sure. our food. And um, this really not a, it's really not that difficult. But uh, you know, quite, quite honestly, Diana, both sides wanna make the issue more than what it is. Mm -hmm. And I've been, you know, I've spent countless hours on Capitol Hill talking to both Republicans and Democrats alike on this issue and, and really just offering up some common sense solutions for agriculture and the reasons from both sides when they when they hear, oh wow, okay, this works. I was so naive the first time I went to Washington. I thought, well, clearly no one has just went there and explained how this should go and right. that it's really not that difficult. And here are a few modifications that we could make that would really help our industry. But unfortunately, our industry at times gets hostage, gets held hostage politically for other things, you know, for on, on both sides of the sure. aisle. And that was incredible to me because I thought, well, all I have to do is go explain to this group how I needed them in business and then how I would explain to this group it, that how it would be much better for you know the workers and the people and then I'll get everybody to agree. And then in the end, I realized no, because that would actually solve the issue and then we wouldn't have anything to, to discuss. To fight about. Exactly. So, <laughs> I'm just saying. <laughs> I, I hear you, but you know. Very frustrating. It is. and. Um, so let's go back. So you've you've now you've started this company. You the company gets successful. You're, you're now you have, you you land Walmart. So what's the next chapters? The next chapter today, or the next chapter well, after I started okay, to build let's that talk business? About, let's talk about the next chapter after that, because I know that there's t probably yeah. a million next sure. chapters. But then you started doing different kinds of products, which yeah. I love. Yeah. Let's talk about your watermelon yeah. juice, your, your prepackaged goods. Mm -hmm. So after, you know, I, I, once I really broadened our retail base and started picking up larger retailers and growing the business and, and, and starting the, the company, it's really, you know, I went through every challenge that pretty much every entrepreneur goes through, right? Mm -hmm. And the questions I had to ask myself from the time I bought the, far, the small family farm was, how do you do more with less? And that's the question that we all sort of have to ask ourselves when starting anything. Mm -hmm. And so the business sort of, you know, got going in fits and starts and my brothers came home. They had all been, you know, at college. They got off the farm and, and went away to, to schools and, and came back and joined me as I was growing the business, which was incredible. But that process and doing that um, was, was quite a journey. And it took us a while to really 
button up the company and to professionalize it and, and do the things that we needed to do to be great partners um, for all of our customers. But in doing that and growing that base of business throughout the years, it, it allowed me to then start thinking about different products that I could sell outside of just fruits and vegetables. By this time, we had become, you know, the nation's largest uh, uh, pumpkin producing company, pumpkin selling co marketing I company. <laughs> I earned the nickname America's Pumpkin Queen. It's great. Um, and I loved pumpkins and everything pumpkin because that was, pumpkins were the first crop that I was able to grow on that farm, the farm that I grew up on. And when I bought that farm, it was the first thing that I planted um, that ultimately, you know, really gave me products to sell and, you know, make money off of that in turn, I was able to, you know, pay, pay for the farm, the farm that I grew up on. So that was a commodity that was very near and dear to my heart. And then there are all these melons and cantaloupes and sweet corn. So we're growing all of these fresh fruits and vegetables. But we took that retailer base of business and I started thinking about the way that I grew up and how the food was really clean, simple and delicious. And if you, it, it, it's really ironic that now the diet that I had as a little kid, where I thought, gosh, we're so impoverished, is actually the coveted healthy diet now. Right. Where, you know, everything that we ate was clean, simple, from the earth. And I thought about how, also how everything that we made on the farm had a purpose and we found a purpose for all of the different pieces of fruit that we grew. Nothing went to waste. We found a purpose for everything. And uh, as I thought through, I would see in our own business, as I saw, as our company was growing and our operations were expanding, I would see things like watermelons going to waste because they were visually imperfect. And they were still really delicious watermelons, but they might have been sun-kissed, which means the top of the watermelon gets a little, it gets Bruce a little yellow mm -hmm. from the sun, and it's not that just solid green. And you could, can't sell those to, to retailers, but they're perfectly good watermelons. And it used to, I would personally struggle with seeing that product go to waste. Sure. Because in, in, in a very visceral way, I remember what it, felt like sometimes to like be hungry you know sure. like and we were never starving but there was still like at times you know a hunger issue and so it bothered me to to the degree where then I became obsessive like how do we how do we prevent waste on our farm so and it's not only ultimately good for you know, the profits that return back to the farm because mm -hmm. you're working with you're, very, very right. slim margins because you're selling commodities on a farm. So it's helpful to that, but it's also helpful to the, the planet to focus on those things. And then also really good for the consumer if you're taking a very fresh, healthy, delicious product and turning it into a different product for a different application. Um, in the case of the watermelon, it was the juice, Sama mm -hmm. watermelon juice, where we took the sun-kissed melons and started converting them to juice on the farm and then bottling it under the brand Sama and selling watermelon juice. So it ultimately ended up being a win-win-win, a win for the farm, a win, you know, uh, a, a win ultimately for the customer and then a win for the planet as well because we were finding, we were utilizing all pieces and parts of the crop. So you sell watermelons, you mm -hmm. sell pumpkins, yeah. you sell watermelon juice. Yeah. What else? Uh, we have an entire line of Sarah's Homegrown um, branded beverages. So be beverage has been something that I've been working on now since about 2014. We should be drinking yes, it right we now. Should, we What's should wrong be, with us? Yes, we should be drinking the watermelon juice. I had my watermelon juice this morning, actually. Um, but I started, and Sama was really the first brand that we launched, and that was inspired by you know using more of the of the, of the melons and finding the greater purpose uh, for the fruit that we were grow growing that would have otherwise been discarded. And then that carried over into the Sarah's Homegrown brand, 
which now we have a line of fresh agua frescas. We have a strawberry uh, agua fresca, a mango agua fresca. That is such a langu mm -hmm. uh, Latin thing. Yes, you know, yes. Like <laughs> when I was a kid, my mom had a juicer. Uh -huh. And she would make carrot juice. Yeah. And I was always like, drinks this up mm -hmm. but then the first time when i went to mexico i'm like they're on every corner yes you know you yeah. drink your vegetable they, right? they, they make juice of everything so yes. i love i love that you call it aguas frescas that yeah. you you want that route yeah the reason that i did that was because i found out that's what it was like how we were growing up on the farm so we would get this fruit and we would muddle the fruit as kids and then literally take this bag of sugar and just dump it into the fruit. Then we would add the water, of we'd course, stir it up. Yeah. We never purchased Kool-Aid, never purchased Kool-Aid. And it's it was so never much in better. Our, never in our house, right? Mm -hmm. So that's what we made to drink. And little did I know that that was, a Latin, that, that was just the, what we were drinking was aguas frescas. And I didn't know until I went to Mexico the first time when I was 18 or 19 years old and was served that beverage. And by this point, I had moved out when I was 15. This is a few years later. I would kind of escaped that life. And then I end up in, in, in Mexico on the beach and I'm drinking a, an Aguas Frescas. And I'm like, that's my this thing. is from oh. my child. Like we made this like, oh, they make this here too. And then the light bulb went off in my head and I thought, well, there you go. Like I did, you don't know what you don't know, but that's what it would have been called. It was the same. It, so it was the same thing. So that's what we started making and, and bottling under Sarah's home. And front. it's so much better than Kool Aid. Oh my God! I mean, yes. you know, we grew up. My mom would take lime yeah. and put. She would use seltzer water, bubbly uh -huh. water. Yeah. That was soda, you know, yeah. and sugar. Yeah. And it was, but to this day, there's nothing better than that. It's you not, know, nothing it's, better because it's more refreshing and. Yeah. So we use the fresh juices and I mean, we make it the same way, but we focused on clean, simple ingredients, nothing artificial. And we also tried to bring the calories down to mm -hmm. deliver that same authentic experience flavor. and flavor and richness, but also in a way that, you know, your, your, your calories and your sugars are Managed. reasonable. Yes. So you wrote a book. And then a television deal spun out of this. Yeah. So that's also on your radar. You're now a TV yeah. producer. Mm -hmm. Yeah. When does when do we get to watch the TV show? Well, hopefully we'll be watching something um, next fall. So 2022, fall of 2022, if everything goes right. You know, it makes me so happy because um, I found your story so inspiring. And then I had the um, fortune to meet you and then I found you so inspiring. And when I when I read the book, I'm like, every teenager needs to read this book mm -hmm. to know you can be and do anything you want to do. Mm -hmm. And I'm so excited about your TV show because I think that there's so many people who feel like they've fallen between the cracks. Yeah. And and the story is so inspiring. And I also love that you did it at such a young age mm -hmm. and that you're a girl. Yeah. You know, what a great uh, mm -hmm. role model you are. Aww. for young women and that was a big reason why I wanted to invite you here um, to share your story with as many people as we can and as many people on the campus as we can um, because it's it's truly um, miraculous what you've done Aww, truly thank you miraculous so much. well I'm I'm really proud to be here because really the community college experience was such a big part of shaping who I was and my future. And without that education and that access to that education, um, hard telling, you know, really what would have happened, but that was a bright spot in our community. And I love to tell people, and it's kind of a, a funny story and a line in the book, that when I find myself, you know, off of the farm and, and you know, dressed in such a way that no one would have <laughs> would ever expect that I'm, uh, you know, that my day jo job is actually farming. Uh, they oftentimes assume that, you know, I might have an Ivy League education. And when people ask me where I went to school, I confidently look them in the eye and I shake them, you know, I shake mm -hmm. their hand, I meet them. And then when they ask that question, I look right at them and I say, I went to Frontier. I love that. And you can tell they're like, 
Frontier, Frontier, Frontier. Where's, where's this, this Yale, co- but they're, Princeton, uh, yeah, Frontier. They're almost embarrassed to ask where is Frontier because they assume that it's some really great private institution <laughs> somewhere. And you know what, it's a wonderful college, but no one really ever does the follow up on where is that, you know, but you That's can see awesome. that they, they, you know, and hey, you know, go Bobcat, Southern Illinois, Frontier Community College all the way. So. I, I am so happy to be here and to be on this campus, and I'm so proud of anyone that takes that, that step and joins their community college. And um, I want everyone to know that, you know, it's so incredibly important and that the education that you get coming out of these schools is just, just as, as good. good just as good in fact you you're you're probably smarter better (laughs) off everything to to start at a really good community college i like to say that you know frontier wasn't a big school but they had a big heart and everyone there and i talk about some of the experiences in the book and and the different instructors because i wasn't just a number i was part of that community and they saw me and they saw really what i was going through what i was trying to build and that made them want to help me more and those were the kind of people and um, who impacted my life and those are the kind of people that that exist on at community college campuses across the country hands down so if you're in a community college congratulations because you are getting an incredible experience around people that care and at the end of the day that's all that matters sarah thank you so much for taking the time to be with us today and i know there are amazing chapters in your future Thank you all so much for watching, and I look forward to seeing you at our next event. For more information on Fry Farms, visit fryfarms.com. If you want to join us on Zoom for the Q&A, just follow the link on the At The Max Show page for today's book club. We look forward to seeing you on Zoom real soon. Thanks for watching.